all, and welcome to the virtual launch of the 2021 Kearney Foreign Direct Investment Confidence Index. Thank you for joining us in this virtual session. We have nearly uh, 200 colleagues with us here today uh, from 39 countries, and we'd like to extend our warmest welcome to all of you. I am Eric Peterson, Managing Director of Kearney's Global Business Policy Council and co-author of the 2021 FDI Confidence Index Report. Before we share the top findings of this year's report and introduce our panel for what I anticipate will be a very engaging and compelling discussion, I'd like to share a few points on the structure of our program here today. First, this event is on the record and will be available online on the Kearney website after it concludes. Second, for those of you wishing to join the conversation on social media, please use hashtag FDICI on Twitter and LinkedIn. Third, additional report details will be emailed to you at the conclusion of the meeting today. And then we have a Q&A segment at the end of our, our session scheduled. If you would like to ask a question, and we encourage you to do that, we kindly request that you send the question to the host by using the chat feature at the bottom right hand part of your screen or by reaching out via email to gbpc at .com. Let me repeat that, gbpc at .com. We will collect the questions received and direct them uh, to the panelists, please note that we'll do our very best to address all of them, uh, but uh, there may be more than we can handle in the time that we have allocated to us. With that, it is now my sincerest pleasure to introduce Paul Laudacina, who will provide introductory remarks. Paul is the Chairman Emeritus of Kearney, the founder of the Global Business Policy Council some 30 years ago, He's co-author of this report and founder of the Foreign Direct Investment Confidence Index in 1998, and also the author of an important forthcoming book entitled Roadmap to a Brighter Future, Reimagining and Realizing America's Possibilities. So with that, by way of short uh, introduction, over to you, please, Paul. Thanks very much, Eric, and it's my great pleasure to add my warm words of welcome to yours at this 23rd annual FDI Confidence Index release event. <clears throat> I think all of us that are on this call know how important FDI is uh, in the economic development of those countries which have managed to attract capital, know-how, and the market engagement that goes uh, with FDI. It not only provides recipient countries with economic opportunity, but also the economic ballast and stability uh, that is so important to economic development, uh, in contrast to other forms of capital transfers that are much more ephemeral, uh, able to come and go at the stroke of a uh, computer key based on the exigencies and vagaries, uh, frankly, of market conditions. So given its importance, we decided, as Eric suggested, way back in 1998, to develop a tool to measure investor attitudes and intentions with respect to uh, FDI, because the only data that was available for, about FDI was from UNCTAD, which was uh, measuring uh, actual data flows, and it was very much a lagging uh, indicator showing flows off in some two years after the investment actually was consummated and certainly long after the decision was taken to invest in a given country. Our methodology is very simple, uh, but yet robust. Uh, we interview a uh, representative uh, group of global CXOs and CEOs who are investors of sizable companies around the world to ask them about their attitudes and intentions for FDI over the next one to three years across a swath of countries that represent 95% of total uh, FDI flows. We don't put any filters on the data, but rather we report it as collected, offering the insights that we have, as Eric will share with you in a moment, uh, based on having studied these kinds of trends for more than two decades. 
Uh, and we're proud of the fact that the actual flows of FDI historically have followed pretty closely the trend lines forecast uh, in our index. This year's uh, report, uh, as you know, is entitled On Shaky Ground, as I think will be apparent um, from the results that uh, Eric uh, will share shortly. Um, not surprisingly, FDI flows have not been spared the shock waves of the pandemic. And the trend we've seen over the last few years has continued of investor flight to safety. In fact, that trend has intensified. But even before the pandemic hit, there were other often not too faint signals of a fundamentally changing global investment calculus driven by technology on the one hand and geopolitics on the other. Uh, all of these factors, trade frictions, national procurement policies, the diminished significance of labor arbitrage as manufacturing activity has become more automated uh, every day, all of these factors in tandem with this growing consumer demand for customization of the products that they buy often have compelled product production to move closer uh, to the consumer end user. And all of this has been leading to an increasing fragmentation of global supply chain. So it's in this context that the world is in the midst of a dramatic rethink of FDI as corporate investors reflect on where they need to be with what kinds of resources over what performance period, uh, what their expectations are for FDI. And it's Frankly, not since the late 1990s that we've seen such a fundamental global strategic recalibration uh, by business. And of course, back in the 90s, it was all of the expansive activity. And today, as the data will show, much of this is contracted uh, activity. And that is a function surely of the pandemic, but also of these factors that were pre-existing conditions um, um, that are changing uh, the global environment uh, for business. So with that bit of context, I'd like to turn it back over to Eric now to share the actual 2021 FDI Confidence Index results. Eric? Thank you, Paul. Um, I'll uh, do that, but uh, let me very briefly uh, introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, and I'll keep their introductions brief. I know they'll forgive me uh, for doing that. Uh, both have extensive credentials that could uh, keep us uh, going for uh, quite some time here, but uh, I know that we'd like to hear their comments with respect uh, to the uh, to the FDICI index. Uh, Daniela Chikova is a partner in Carney's financial practice. Uh, she has extensive consulting and industry experience, an expert in banking with a focus on retail banking and top line growth strategies. She is a recognized leader in financial services in Austria. Uh, she's joining us from uh, outside of Vienna today. Uh, Daniela has published a variety of articles and is frequently quoted by media about the current and future state of the banking industry. Uh, she also lectures on strategy implementation, post-merger integration of Vienna Economics University. And I should also note that Daniela is doing uh, cutting edge thinking in our firm on the evolving economics of information and data, some of which uh, we have highlighted in this special focus feature of our index this year. Antone Pastore uh, is a uh, senior partner at Carney uh, with over 30 years of consulting experience assisting Italian and international banks international companies in the area of strategy, organizational design and operations with a focus on business growth, distribution models, and performance improvement. Uh, he's been engaged in uh, Carney leadership over the years. Uh, he's also the former global and EMEA leader of Carney's financial institutions practice. Both of them are wonderful and uh, deep thinking uh, colleagues. A reminder to all of you joining this call, after our panel discussion, we'll take your questions and reactions. Please, if you'd like to, uh, to uh, ask a question, uh, we send it to the host at the bottom of the screen or send it by uh, email to gvpc at 
www.ncpsa.gov.com. And now it's my pleasure to present the main findings of the report. When we first launched the FDI Confidence Index in 1998, it was the first of its kind in terms of examining forward-looking indicators of FDI flows. You've heard from the pioneer here, Paul Leda, a lot is seen on this point. This annual report is a survey of global business executives who play a decisive role in FDI decisions for their companies. It is not Carney's judgment, but rather a reflection of the survey. Rather than focus on historical data, as Paul outlined, our survey of global investors was and is designed to examine companies' FDI intentions, as well as broader FDI investment trends over the next three years. We continue to believe that this is a one of a kind in providing leaders with foresight and peripheral vision in helping to identify broader issues influencing FDI decision making, be it geopolitics or technology. The survey has a strong track record of picking up not only top FDI destinations, but pinpointing overall macroeconomic and business environment trends that are just forming at the time of the survey but uh, become apparent in the years ahead. So as Paul has mentioned, the title of our index this year is On Shaky Ground. And now let's move uh, forward to uh, the slide, Allison, please. Here are the top line results of our index rankings this year. The US again tops the index, holding its first place position for the ninth year in a row. The top five markets for FDI intentions are again all developed markets, continuing a trend as Paul mentioned, which started uh, some years back. Canada and Germany maintain the second and third places respectively, and the UK jumps to fourth place. Uh, Japan uh, falls slightly to the fifth position with very small margins, I should note. And the top 10 countries on the index remain unchanged from last year, with the exception of Spain displacing China on the top 10. Next slide, please. Developed markets maintain their highest share ever. This is the flight to safety that Paul was talking about. Those developed markets take 22 out of our top 25 spots. And this is not only a COVID phenomenon. As uh, Paul mentioned, this is the third consecutive year. Our conclusions are there are two primary reasons for that. First, those established uh, markets represent more safety and stability. And second, investors continue to assign priority destinations with strong infrastructure and investment in technology and innovation. We should also note that China, which has held strong positions in the rankings for years, it topped our index from the years 2002 to 2012, has dropped to the 12th position. Now, it clearly got a very strong rebound economically earlier than other markets uh, last year, in fact, uh, after the uh, coronavirus. But we think that this result may reflect escalated U.S.-China trade tensions, as well as the broader corporate rethink underway on supply chains and increased uh, reshoring uh, in recent years. Next slide, please. European markets dominate this year's index results as well. They have 15 of the top 25 markets. Continued investor focus on European markets likely stems, we believe, from overall friendly regulatory environments coupled with skilled workforces, advanced tech infrastructure, and economic stability. Next slide, please. And with that, now I'd like to turn to the effects of uh, the pandemic on the index results uh, this year. Next slide, please. Last year's index suggested that many in investors were caught flat-footed by the pandemic. We had our survey last year in the field immediately prior to the onset of the pandemic and then at the very beginning phases. So, uh, in effect, we got mixed signals. 
this year's results were different. They indicate that a year into the pandemic, investors appear uh, to have been chastened. Next slide, please. Three months into 2021, max vaccination, max mass vaccination programs are underway in many countries and conditions as we all have seen have started to improve. Most broader projections of macroeconomic recovery, including our own at the Global Business Policy Council, predict that the economy will rebound. Our, our own data suggests that we could see at the global level 5.6% this year. Next slide, please. Yet the key point for our purposes here today is that global FDI flows collapsed dramatically, as you would expect, in 2020 and are expected to remain persistently low this year, at least according to the UN Conference on Trade and Development, suggesting a more challenging outlook for FDI flows, at least in the short term. Next slide. And all this aligns with our findings in the index, especially with respect to the drop in investor optimism. When we asked them how optimistic they were on the global economy, and remember, this is a three-year outlook, only 57% express optimism this year, which is even lower than it was last year ago, immediately before and, and during the immediate onset of the pandemic, when the corresponding figure was 72%. Next slide, please. In addition, most of the overall scores for the top 25 economies have also fallen in absolute terms and tightened. In fact, only five of these economies registered higher than they did last year in 2020. And we believe that this reflects concerns about the uncertain state of the economic recovery and also suggests that respondents are less inclined uh, to invest overall than they were last year uh, before they knew the uh, about uh, the COVID-19 circumstances. Next slide, please. The fact that fewer investors say they intend to invest across all types of markets compared to last year also reinforces this broader theme of caution that we believe exists among investors. Next slide, please. Overall, two-thirds of companies said that they plan to increase their foreign direct investment over the next three years, which is a notable decline from the 82% of investors who said that last year. The silver lining is perhaps that 81% of our respondents this year suggested they believe that foreign direct investment will drive corporate profitability and competitiveness over the foreseeable future, namely the next three years, which is only a slight decrease from the 84% who advanced the same view last year. Next slide, please. Developed markets show particular strength in governance and regulatory factors, specifically tax rates and ease of tax payments, along with tech and innovation capabilities and R&D capabilities, especially important this year, which uh, has gone up, you'll see by the ranking here, uh, significantly, which are among the factors that investors are assigning, using to assign priority uh, in their investment decisions. Uh, I'd encourage you when you have a little more time uh, to look at this uh, important chart. So these findings are significant. Next slide, please. This year, investors point to a rise in commodity prices as the top risk that they perceive in terms of direct investment flows, followed by both an increase in geopolitical tensions, no surprise there, and an economic crisis that might emerge in one or more emerging markets. A fast-growing global economy would lead to greater demand for commodities and tied uh, for the second most likely development is an increase in geopolitical tensions and an economic crisis in an emerging market. Concern for geopolitical tensions is certainly unsurprising uh, from our point of view, given the economic and tech rivalry between the US and China, although it goes so uh, far beyond that, of course. And the preconditions for an economic crisis in an emerging market 
uh, we think uh, are intensified by the uneven vaccine rollouts and healthcare consequences and therefore macroeconomic reverberations that we see in a number of emerging markets. Next slide, please. The global spread of uh, COVID underlined the paramount importance and value of data. And uh, as part of our foreign direct investment confidence index, we have zoomed in on specific uh, issue areas uh, over the years. And this year, as I mentioned earlier in uh, my introduction of uh, Daniela, uh, we wanted to focus some questions uh, even more sharply on the uh, value, the economic uh, value of data and information. Uh, this is uh, the, the, uh, the basis of our thematic uh, section in this year's index. Next slide. So what did it uh, what did it suggest? Uh, data provides investors clearly with a range of benefits from improved internal efficiency uh, to high market effectiveness. Yet uncertain, uncertainty about data governance and increasing regulations also emerged as key takeaways from our thematic uh, section. Next slide. To explore these results more closely, investors make clear that data is vital uh, to their revenue streams. In fact, 65% say that 11 to 30% of their turnover is generated through data. Next slide, please. On the other hand, many of these respondents cite burgeoning data regulations as affecting their foreign direct investment decisions. As we noted in uh, our council's document uh, that we call year ahead predictions, uh, data privacy rules uh, have proliferated and are now proliferating in a number of key markets. And with such regulations on the horizon or already in effect, many investors are seeing data protection regulations as imposing high costs on their foreign direct investment prerogatives. Next slide, please. Getting into the specifics of data regulations, the findings are striking. Local storage requirements, local processing requirements, and restrictions on data transfers all have a significant impact on FDI for the majority of investors. Next slide. And compliance with these data privacy protection regulations comes uh, in many cases with a heavy price tag. A full 46% of respondents said that complying with di local data storage requirements is costing them up to $1 million a year, $1 million a year, while an additional 40% of investors spend between one and $10 million a year. Next slide. And uh, our uh, view, and we've been watching the whole notion of uh, nationalism very carefully in our council, uh, was affirmed uh, that a wild card for investors is data nationalism. A vast majority of investors, 71% are concerned about data nationalism. And this is aligned with broader trends toward greater national self-sufficiency that we have seen during and coming out of this COVID-19 uh, period. Indeed, in our council's global trends uh, report uh, from uh, looking at longer range trends from the year 2020 to 2025, we point out that national efforts to support domestic technology and restrict foreign products were already underway uh, pre-COVID. Next slide, please. So now we move into the panel discussion here. And again, I'd like to encourage you to send us uh, your questions. But I'd like to uh, ask our panelists some questions about their reactions to this index that relate to their specific areas of interest and expertise. Uh, and then after that, as mentioned, I'll be opening things up uh, to you, the audience, for your questions. But let me turn first to Ettore for his views on how the results of this year's index jive with the market conditions that he's seen uh, from his perch in Italy. He comes to us uh, from Milano today. Uh, Ettore, our survey results suggest that investors are very cautious uh, in the uh, end stages we all hope and pray of the uh, COVID crisis. 
Have you found that to be the case of the companies that you're working with? And how do you see companies changing their approach to investment uh, during and after the pandemic? Hi, Eric. Hi, everybody. Thanks for your nice invitation. Um, well, I would say yes. I mean, uh, the the what you said uh, applies also to these markets, Italy and Europe uh, in particular. I would say that um, the global economic crisis uh, due to COVID have certainly certainly uh, created the conditions for companies for being much more cautious than last year. Con con uh, co regarding the investments overall, uh, but but they are continuing. They are continuing in their investment st stream. So the good news is that they have not stopped at all. Uh, they are, um, in any case, I would say much more selective than before. So um, you ask me how they have changed their approach, and I would say, um, first of all, uh, their selective attitude goes into specific uh, um, types of investments, basically automation, information technology investments, digitalization, and artificial intelligence. These streams will never stop, in my opinion, over the last, uh, over the, over the next uh, few years. And uh, actually, uh, they have increased uh, um, their, uh, their importance in the selection of, uh, of the companies that uh, we work with. Um, another area of interest, in my opinion, will be uh, the um, mergers. We see um, clearly the emergence of uh, this trend of um, consolidation. And uh, although, although COVID and everything was uh, obviously a, an obstacle, but um, important mergers are going on. And I think this is related to the need, uh, you know, putting together uh, the right size, but also the right capabilities that is consistent also with what we've seen in, um, in, in going through the report that you have uh, nicely presented. Um, and I would say also the change going forward in the types of investments that companies will do will also be connected with the stimulus packages that are going to be launched by most of the governments um, in uh, in our in our globe, uh, U.S. Uh, packages, uh, European packages, uh, the U.K. as well, Japan. So these will affect for sure uh, the 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 you know the kind of investments that our 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 clients are going to are going to make. Um, last and uh, this is connected with FDI particularly. I would say there is a sh kind of shift. Uh, from FDI to local to local investments. That's uh, that's in a nutshell what I see. Thank you, Ed Tode. And now maybe we could shift uh, Daniela to you. I know that you were uh, interested, as were we, in the results of the uh, the uh, thematic focus section of uh, of our index this year on data and information. And uh, as you saw, the respondents cited the. Uh, a wide range of benefits from data movement, cross-border data flows. Do you think that the pandemic has changed the way that uh, companies use and rely on data in their day-to-day -day operations? Or do you think maybe the pandemic has accelerated pre-existing trends? Or has there been a shift? Good morning, everybody. And um, Eric, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think it is a very interesting one. Data is very important for companies. Um, we see that the vast majority of uh, companies, no matter whether large or small, well over 90%, um, say that data is an integral part of their operations and indeed of their day-to-day -day operations. Data has become um, essential for many businesses across different industries and different countries. Um, we see from the study that you mentioned um, at the beginning that 60% of the companies use data for market effectiveness, so for reaching their clients, for understanding better their client needs. 60% use it for boosting the efficiency. For exa example, um, both you and Paul mentioned um, supply chains. Connecting geographically dispersed operations is doable through data, and data plays 
an essential role, monitoring processes real time, being able to intervene um, and maintain processes um, and technologies is also done through data. This is um, an essential part, especially of what um, industrial companies do. And data is enabling access to IT and infrastructure, what Etra mentioned, access to big data analytics, um, artificial intelligence, um, cloud computing, uh, and so on. So how has the, pand the pandemic uh, changed this? Um, I think there is a tremendous acceleration that we have seen in the use of data. I mean, who of us would have thought maybe at this time last year that we will not be occasionally just doing video conferences, but we'll be sitting most of the day and we'll be talking per video with our clients, with our suppliers, with our colleagues. Our lives have changed in a tremendous way. It is important and uh, um, it is very often cited how e-commerce has developed um, in the last 12 years. There has been a tremendous acceleration in the number of persons who buy online, in uh, the size of the purchases, the frequency of the purchases, the increase in the digital payments, and in particular also the contactless payments in order to avoid infection um, at the point of sale. There are a lot of changes which have been adopted by consumers and have been supported in a similar way um, through companies. My perception is that we have managed in a matter of few months actually to um, generate a tremendous impact and tremendous development, which would have been otherwise doable potentially in a matter of several years um, even. So, the pandemic has accelerated the data use. I think that new data uses in addition, those are uses that we might not have anticipated so far, um, but uses that have turned out to be very important uh, in the context of the pandemic. For example, the contact tracing, which was enabled by data or uses like um, the current administration and tracking of uh, the vaccination efforts that a lot of countries are in. So data is an integral part of um, the company's uh, daily operations, and it will stay so in the coming months and years, for sure. Thank you, Daniela. Um, Anthony, maybe we could go back to you. And I, I, I first of all, uh, Chair's prerogative here, I'd like to thank the audience for uh, what is a stream of very interesting and good questions. Please keep them uh, coming, uh, questions and reactions. Um, and many of them uh, relate to the uh, results that we have on the index that uh, developed markets have again captured the highest share uh, in this year's index. And Paul, maybe after Etode speaks, you might want to weigh in on this. Um, but uh, Etode, what do you think this is all about? And to what extent do you think that uh, the effect of the pandemic uh, has changed the distribution of countries in our uh, top 25 list, at least so far as we know in the next three years? And uh, in your view, are there other factors at play as well? Uh, yes, the interesting question. I think we have touched it a bit, uh, so I'll be uh, I'll be very synthetic. But uh, again, uh, it's very important uh, uh, to notice this because it's a it's a trend which uh, didn't start yesterday. Uh, but um, it is uh, mainly and it is mainly related to uh, the the search for. Uh, for um, for cautiousness, basically, which in business terms means uh, uh, stability, means stability, being safe, uh, as we as we said and Paul mentioned in the opening as well. Um, and this is um, kind of uh, kind of logical. Uh, for uh, for the rest, uh, it's uh, obvious that in these years, uh, FDI uh, occur only when there is a very high content of innovation in making these, these investments. This is another trend that we have noticed over the years. And this, of course, is um, logically correlated to the developed markets. So that's the reason why uh, this, uh, this happens. So it's uh, only COVID, no, but COVID has certainly exacerbated this kind of trend, in, uh, in my opinion. Um, there are other reasons, you ask me. Um, well, again, uh, as I mentioned before, in my opinion, um, consciously or not, investors are positioning themselves 
into the markets where you know the massive uh, government investments are coming so there is a uh, mix effect of this and the huge umbrella provided by the central banks that should logically uh, allow uh, you know the investments made into these areas what we call the developed markets uh, safer and um, yeah safer basically i'm not talking about the level of profitability that's another matter but at least uh, safer i think uh, these uh, uh, you know the foreign invest the fdis could be a, a big leverage for these uh, for these programs if you put together the effect of you know government and, and private investments you can you can really get uh, very very interesting results for the development of our economies thank you today um, Paul, a number of the questions that uh, or reactions that are coming in now are uh, as much focused on the preeminence of uh, of the advanced economies in the top 25 list, but also the absence of some very significant uh, developing uh, uh, economies uh, on the list this year. And there are some conspicuous absences to be sure. We only have uh, three uh, developing or emerging uh, uh, economies uh, on the list, as we've already pointed out. Um, how do you see this from your perspective? You've been watching this uh, back and forth over the years, although we've never seen something quite like the uh, COVID pandemic uh, during the uh, tenure of the uh, of the index. But how do you, how do you perceive things? Well, Eric, since the um, start of the index, uh, two of the factors that have always driven investor decision making uh, in a very significant way have been the size and relative robustness of the market conditions uh, in the potential host country. And of course, if we look at um, what is likely to be sustained um pandemic uh impact uh in developing countries just because of the difficulty of the vaccine rollout and reaching herd immunity there um that compounds what is likely to be slower growth prospects for developing countries on top of what is already this move toward a technological innovation which as ettore said uh, is increasingly important uh, in the investors' uh, decision making. And you combine that with the developed country government's ability and willingness to create huge stimulus programs to enhance economic activity. It all means that over an extended period of time, it's not surprising that developed markets, at least in my view, um, that the trend toward developed market predominance uh, as uh, preferred destinations for FDI will continue uh, for the foreseeable future. I should note that one of the comments was uh, focused on uh, the TSMC investment of billions in a new uh, chip factory in Arizona here in the U.S. And uh, Intel's announcement yesterday that it would be investing uh, 20 billion in new fab investments also in Arizona. Um, and certainly that uh, highlights uh, a, a huge uh, level of interest with respect to uh, techno relative technology positions in the future and kind of building on uh, the national stimulus packages and uh, the safety of environment that uh, you all have mentioned. Let's, let's go back if we can to, uh, to data, the issue of data for a moment, Daniela. Um, a majority of investors told us in the index that they see existing or proposed data regulations, including, as I mentioned, uh, local storage requirements, processing requirements, uh, various restrictions on data transfers, uh, is having a big effect on intentions with respect to direct investment. Uh, and uh, we also uh, saw in the survey that uh, investors are also focused on how some countries are implementing digital taxes or data privacy. Uh, how do you see this playing out in the markets? How are the companies you are working with uh, responding to these developments and how is the operating environment changing for them uh, as a result of these policies? I know that 
requires generalizations, of course, but it'd be good to get your uh, commanding heights point of view. Data regulation has become very important for companies, and uh, it was mentioned also earlier in this discussion, but I want to um, emphasize it one more time. Data is extremely important for the revenue streams of companies, and a significant share of the revenue streams are today dependent on data. Data regulation on the other side, um, while it creates transparency and clear rules of the game, does not come for free. It comes at a certain cost. This cost is not negligible. Um, you mentioned um, certain ranges, which are really impressive. Um, and uh, I will not repeat those, but a lot of the companies that we work with and a lot of the companies on the market are well aware of the additional cost burden, which comes um, in order to ensure compliance with regulation. And I would add um, a third factor that we have um, looked into um, in a lot of detail recently. The number of data regulations in the last 20 years has tremendously accelerated. There have been a new, a lot of new regulations coming into a number of markets. There have been changes to existing uh, data regulations in certain markets, and typically those changes have, um, have been tightening of the requirements for sharing, processing, transferring data across international borders. Um, with all three, all these three factors coming together, there are a lot of implications for companies. The most important one probably is that they need to be continuously monitoring and continuously on the outlook about current and pending regulation. And a lot of companies um, are well aware of this and are very rigorously and strictly monitoring what is out there, what is coming, and also preparing for that. Um, there is a second element, which is around um, building in the internal capabilities in order to be able to respond to the requirements that data regulation puts. Those are um, requirements in terms of how data is stored, where is data processed. There are solutions that need to be developed on the technical, on the legal side in order to respond to those requirements. And there are, there are also specialists, which companies um, very often need to employ in order to be adequately prepared and also quickly responding to changes in the regulation. And last but not least, and specifically um, now related to foreign direct investment, I see companies continuously um, re-evaluating uh, their investments and considering the incremental benefits versus the incremental costs, which are um, expected out of an investment, um, continuously being on the outlook for opportunities and in this evaluation, um, data regulation, the cost of data regulation plays a significant role. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, we've had an interesting question coming up. Maybe, Ettore, you might, uh, you might take this one on. Um, a number of countries, including several EU member states and Australia, have tightened their FDI rules uh, on national security grounds. That certainly applies to the U.S. as well as more countries seek to become self-sufficient in various sectors. Um, from, from your point of view at today, how might this affect uh, trends in uh, FDI flows? Uh, for sure, for sure, this is an interesting question. I agree. Uh, the, um, the regulations uh, which are uh, uh, the result of uh, the crisis uh, that the governments are are putting on uh, will limit uh, for sure, in my opinion, FDI. That's uh, that's out of questions. Um, which means that uh, uh, they will be even more and more selective, and uh, and, um, and, and 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 of course uh, will go toward uh, you know very high added value kind of. Uh, Kind of investments because uh, management has to concentrate a lot, you know, to manage uh, all these constraints uh, that uh, will be put uh, into into place. I hope this uh, will change after the uh, economic crisis will uh, will fade away, or you know, the economic conditions will 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 improve. Paul, you've you've been watching this uh, index uh, over the years, and we've had fluctuations, and certainly. Uh, these uh, these uh, um, uh, constraints on foreign direct investment flows 
uh, have uh, ebbed and flowed. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I'm wondering if what what you know your your long view is on this. Uh, we seem to be, uh, you know, building on what Ettore has just said. We seem to be moving in a number of areas of uh, increased uh, activity here, uh, and um, I, 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 it's uh, striking to me that uh, this is beginning to cross boundaries and sectors that. Uh, go a little bit beyond the traditionally defined national security framework. Um, what, what, what kind of uh, big ticket uh, conclusions do you draw from uh, these, this, this movement? Well, I think, you know, the policy decisions that governments will take coming out of the pandemic will be critical in setting the conditions for the next generation of economic activity. Um, the pandemic, uh, you know, has had this uh, anomaly of at the same time that we close borders in order to protect ourselves. We know that the only way we can actually sustainably protect ourselves is by cooperating across borders. Uh, and that's, uh, if you will, kind of a metaphor for what really needs to happen in terms of global economic activity. FDI will continue to be an extraordinarily important vehicle and mechanism for advancing economic growth prospects. Um, and if the developing world is not to experience a lost decade, as some have called it uh, for the years uh, ahead of us because of the setback of the pandemic, it's going to take a degree of global cooperation, not just in terms of policies that governments take, resisting the temptation to come up with nationalist protectionist solutions uh, as a result of the accelerated impact of the pandemic, but also uh, that business must take uh, working with government to understand, you know, Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa, announced some time ago uh, when I was there for a meeting on foreign direct investment that South Africa missed the first three industrial revolutions, and it can't afford to miss the fourth one. Uh, so how developing countries will be able to leverage and access technology with the assistance of industry and the cooperation of developed countries will in fact help establish the conditions as far as the eye can see for the next generation of economic activity and stability. Thanks, Paul. Uh, you know, this time just goes by so quickly, but I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we could get uh, each one of you to weigh in uh, with uh, short uh, deliberations about what surprised you uh, in uh, this year's uh, index. Uh, maybe, Daniela, we could begin with you. Well, I, I wouldn't say that uh, um, the index is a surprise. I have known it for a while and following it um, very um, rigorously and with a lot of interest. What I am extremely pleased, though, is that data um, and the awareness about the importance of data, the importance of data regulation for companies and in particular for foreign direct investment decisions um, has become and has uh, gotten such a prominent role in the index um, this year. Um, so thank you for this and for the opportunity to share my thoughts on it today. Delighted, delighted. And today, um, thank you again for uh, joining us together with Daniela. Um, what what were there surprises that you had from the uh, from the index? Well, I don't want to I don't want to repeat, uh, but I I like to stress the uh, the importance of. Uh, the connection between data and FDI, but Daniela has covered that uh, very well. I stress uh, this in any case, uh, this will be something to really, really um, follow very carefully in the next years, the new, the new gold mines. But apart from this, uh, overall, um, I would say my surprise is uh, that uh, although the economic conditions are the ones that we know, pandemic, et cetera, I am surprised that there is still uh, this, um, you know, at the end, um, willingness to continue to push with FDIs. Although, although we know there is a big difference between intention and reality, we all know that. But without intentions, there, there won't be any reality. So uh, it, it is uh, it is very surprising at the end of the of the day that uh, this is still very high 
in uh, in the in the agenda and i'm happy about this uh if i may i'd like to add just uh, my 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 own reaction on this um I was, uh, uh, I found it very striking that a number of uh, very significant uh, developing economies were included on the index this year. I understand uh, the flight to safety uh, point of view. I understand that the uh, pie, the FDI uh, uh, pie is getting smaller and will take uh, some years to recover. Uh, all that we can stipulate to. Uh, but uh, really, uh, very surprising, a number of uh, significant uh, emerging markets uh, didn't find their way into the rankings. Um, and uh, I'd like to advise our viewers here today uh, that the FDICI, our index, is a snapshot, of course. Uh, it was in the field uh, for uh, several weeks and... Uh, you know, every year we take this critical snapshot and my guess is that we'll see uh, the balance uh, shift again uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, that was the big surprise for me. And now maybe uh, we could turn to you, Paul, uh, for not only your reactions uh, to this question about surprise, uh, but also your kind of broader uh, uh, considerations in terms of how the index uh, fits in this year. Yeah, I guess, uh, uh, Eric, uh, my biggest surprise was that I wasn't surprised uh, by uh, the trend lines that we see. Uh, they are consistent. I think uh, oftentimes we're left scratching our heads saying, why would investors think that way? And again, it's important to remind our audience that these uh, results are the reflection of investor attitudes and intentions. Um, no, we're not suggesting they're right or wrong. It is a snapshot of what, how investors are sizing up the world. One thing is clear to me, just from a summary perspective, and it's somewhat obvious. If you look at the cliff that FDI volumes has fallen off of, uh, and you look at all of the forecasts, including our own, of how long it's going to take FDI to recover to the you know, global $2 trillion level that we were at not too many years ago. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there is going to be an extraordinarily intense competition for this reduced uh, flow or volume uh, of FDI dollars. Uh, and therefore, the importance of investment uh, promotion authorities, of governments, of uh, industry to collaborate with government to attract investment uh, being highly targeted in the kind of investment you attract. Most countries want to sell what they've got on their shelf rather than take a hard look with a sharp pencil at what their assets and liabilities are and look at the competitive environment and make some decision about what they should be selling in order to be competitive. Uh, so I think that uh, going from where we are to where we're likely to be is that uh, it's going to require an extraordinary amount of effort on the part of both public and private sector to restart the FDI engine and to ensure that not only corporate objectives are being met by FDI, but government needs for uh, rejuvenation that comes from the infusion, not just of capital, but of the technology know-how associated with FDI, all of that's gonna be critically important in the immediate uh, years ahead. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we'll be sending out a link uh, to uh, all of uh, you participants uh, to the final report uh, very shortly. I think it should have just come across uh, to you from uh, Allison McDougall on our council team. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your insightful questions. As we predicted, uh, there were far too many for us to address, but we're grateful uh, for them, and uh, uh, and uh, we tried to do the best we could in terms of our, our uh, time constraints. Uh, but I'd like to conclude with sincerest thanks uh, to Daniela Chikova, Ettore Pastore for uh, taking part. Really wonderful to have you both with us. Uh, and to thank, as always, the, uh, the co-author of the report and the founder of the FDICI, Paul Laudacina, for his uh, continued and uh, and uh, deeply appreciated leadership in this effort. And I'd also like to acknowledge with uh, appreciation 
uh, the research leads on this year's index from our uh, Global Business Policy Council team, uh, Terry Toland, Rodina Belbarova, Gabriela Hudart, and Rebecca Grenham, and the entire team, which uh, turned around the report this year in record time. So thank you all so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, we've been grateful to have you with us and look forward to bringing you uh, more by way of uh, thought leadership products from our Global Business Policy Council in the future. Uh, if you look at your screen now, we have global trends coming up, year ahead predictions. Uh, we have just released a global economic outlook. Our council perspective looks at the economic consequences of climate change this year. And of course, the FDI confidence index that brings us here together today. So from the Kearney community, uh, thank you so much for joining and we look forward to having you back soon.